So uh, I want to talk to you guys today about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, actually, very near and dear to my head, as I'll tell you in a second. So uh, in Iraq in 2009, I was conducting combat search and rescue operations with various special operations task force. And uh, we were actually hoisting a patient up to our HH-60. And uh, due to a series of events, which today we still don't understand, I ended up with a loop of the hoist cable around my neck. Luckily, I had a friend who was on point, and he flipped it off my neck, and I didn't know what to say. I was actually really embarrassed, to tell you the truth. I was shocked that I actually really thought that I was good at situational awareness. And what I realized was, man, it can go south in an instant. And when I started thinking about it a little bit more, what I realized was part of the problem was that I didn't really understand what situational awareness really was. I thought it was about paying attention, right? Making sure you don't walk off a cliff or wander into the rotor blade. Well, it's actually much more than that. It's actually a much more complex cognitive process. Yeah, it starts out with perceiving things around you, actually seeing things in the environment, but there's more to it. Your brain has to process, understand what all those stimuli mean, and from there, take the next step and project into the future what's going to happen if this series of events continues. So when I started to analyze my practice in detail, both my tactical practice and my medical practice, what I realized was I was really short on situational awareness. There were a lot of gaps in how I was operating. And actually, what's even scarier, when I started looking at the literature, if you look at every major disaster in the last 100 years, in every major industry, avion or air medical and aviation in general, nuclear power industry, the military, loss of situational awareness is one of the top causative factors. What's even worse is that in the pre-hospital world, we haven't developed really good ways to teach our people how to be aware of what's going on around them. We tell them just keep an eye on the monitor, watch the endotracheal tube. And that, unfortunately, is a big time fail, in my opinion, especially as someone who's really interested in human factors. So I think we can do much better than that. So I propose to you essentially two ideas, two things I think we can do to get much better at this. Number one, we can build active systems to promote situational awareness. And when I talk about active systems, I mean active behaviors, actions, things we can actually do, teach to people. So take, for instance, our combat pilots. When my pilot's overhead and he's hovering over me about to winch me up, he's not just staring down at me. He's actually looking at me and then coming up, looking at the horizon, looking at his instruments, looking down. Horizon, instruments, down. Likewise, when we're operating, if I'm coming up to a building, I'm not just staring at the door I'm going to. I'm looking at every possible area that could be a threat. Roof, window, window, door. Roof, window, window, door. Constantly looking for stuff. And I think we can do the same thing in medicine. We can teach people these habits in resuscitation. I call this developing your resuscitation circle of awareness. So take, for example, an out-of-hospital airway procedure. The person at the head, the person who's actually instrumenting the airway, has what we call local situational awareness. They're essentially focused 100% on what's going on with that airway, making sure that they can get that tube into the trachea. The other team members, however, bear the responsibility of maintaining global situational awareness over everything else that's going on. So we might train someone, for instance, one of the other team members, to scan down the patient, looking from head to pelvis, looking for any changes or clinical deterioration. Then, going over to the monitor, looking at the monitor, blood pressure, heart rate, SpO2, good. Then over to their teammates, making sure their teammates are good, the person doing the airways got what they need, excellent. Heads up, look all the way around, make sure the environment hasn't changed. So that's just one trick. That's just one behavior that we could develop. And people have suggested others. You heard about an awesome one today, a technique that I think can promote situational awareness as soon as you step into the recess bay or when you're headed out to retrieve a patient, which I think is awesome. And there's a number of other examples. But I want to move on to the next point, which is taking that behavior and turning it into a habit. 
What do I mean by that? Habits are really powerful things. And really what I'm talking about is taking that behavior and making it automatic. Think about all the habits you do on a daily basis. Think about the habits you already have in resuscitation. I bet there's a lot of things you do automatically when you get on a scene you don't think about. And that's key, because as several other people have talked about, when we're under stress, that cognitive bandwidth shrinks. So we need automatic ingrained procedures that draw very little off that cognitive bandwidth. Now, if you go to the literature and talk about habits and automatic behaviors, most of it up till recently actually talks about bad habits, right? They discuss addiction pathology and how that whole reward circuitry, that habit circuitry in your brain can get hijacked, but there's way more to it. And if we learn from our colleagues in the psychology industry, especially regarding software, applications, games, the ever-addictive Twitter, which I've seen a lot of people have been on all day, they have developed ways to develop consumer habits, very effectively, I might add. So I'm going to give you the quick down and dirty recipe how to develop the habit. You have to start out with a cue. You have to start out with a behavior, an environmental stimulus, something that acts as a trigger, that kicks off the habit. So in this case, going back to that pre-hospital RSI scenario, if my partner is doing the airway and I'm there pushing the medications, I'll go ahead and give the induction agent, give the relaxant, flush, make sure it's in, and then start my scan. Next, you need a specific action sequence. So as it turns out, if we give someone something very vague to do, like, hey, just look around or keep an eye on the patient, that motor pattern isn't imprinted on the brain very well at all. You quickly forget it. But if you give someone a specific task, look at X and then Y and then Z, that can be ingrained very well. The last piece is a variable reward. And this is already kind of you know, programmed into what we do, right? I mean, unless you're a sociopath, you are invested in actually good outcome for your patient. And usually most people in a completely non-randomized control trial demonstrated that they'd rather not die. So as it turns out, we're invested in it. It's very rewarding when we find things that could prevent or avert uh, possible catastrophe. So it's those three things. That is the holy trinity of the habit. Now, a lot of people ask, well, how much do you have to do it? Well, the last piece is a lot of repetition, a lot. We're not exactly sure how much. It's somewhere between 20 and 220 or more, so there's a lot of disagreement. But what I can tell you is it needs to happen quite a bit and should be incorporated into daily practice. So what I want you guys to leave here with is two important things. One, we shouldn't be just telling people to be aware. We should help them develop behaviors that can promote situation awareness. And two, we need to turn those systems into habits and incorporate them into everything we do to protect ourselves and help our patients. Thank you guys very much. It remains true. I'm still... No, Mike Gloria. Do we have some questions? You're much better looking than Mike Gloria, I gotta tell you. Well. <laughs> Nothing? Yes, Wait. we have questions. Quickly. <laughs> no pressure. Oh, they're slacking on the job, these guys. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's see. There's so much, though. People are really entertained. You know, you've got to sift through it. Uh, what other cognitive tools are available to help maintain situa situational awareness? And then I'll just piggyback on this. How can we leverage our current use of simulation training to develop good situational awareness habits? Okay. Um, so there's a couple other tools out there. Uh, Cliff mentioned one. He talked about it with you guys this morning, uh, the Zero Point Survey. There's another one. I had the privilege when I was down in... Uh, in Australia working with those guys at Sydney Sam's uh, two years ago that we were talking about situational awareness. And one of their uh, brilliant paramedics, Marty Pierce, came up with a, a similar type scan for uh, in moving into looking at problems uh, with intubated patients or dynamic situations with intubated patients, like moving them in and out of the helicopter. And I believe the acronym he came up with is OBSERVE. So observe the monitor, look at the monitor, look at the subject or the patient, uh, then look at the endotracheal tube. I can spell respiratory equipment, so scan the uh, ventilator down, going down the tubing. 
and there's an E and some odd letters in there. But <laughs> go ahead. I would, I would encourage you to go ahead to the Sydney Hems website and, uh, and actually look. Uh, it's, a, it's a couple really great videos, and that's an awesome tool. How do we develop that? That's an excellent question. So there's some sneaky sort of psychological tricks we can do. Um, you can actually manipulate scenarios when you guys are training people to, to get these systems to work to enhance that reward. So th and that relies on essentially traditional operant conditioning. So let's say, for example, we were doing that RSI scenario. If you notice the person's not looking around or not maintaining awareness, you can throw little things into the scenario that'll screw them up. Uh, on the flip side of that, if the person is watching what's going on and you throw things into the scenario, you can tweak the intrinsic and external and extrinsic stressors and what's going on in the scenario to make things easier. We all know that that's kind of synthetic. That's not how the real world works, but it enhances that reward pathway because they think they do really good in the scenario because they found out what's going on. So it's a sneaky little trick, but it enhances that pathway and it ingrains that habit a little bit better.